Welcome to the Armory Show, if you have not already been in here this morning, and welcome to Armory Live. It's my pleasure to introduce the talk this afternoon between Lynn Cook, Senior Curator at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and artist Nick Mouse. Lynn Cook and Nick Mouse will use two recent major projects as a backdrop for a conversation about artistic and curatorial practice and the relationship between vanguard art and other modes of creativity in the history of modernism. Cook's, self, Cook's traveling exhibition, Outliers and American Vanguard Art, examined important intersections of self-taught artists with the mainstream, and Mouse's transmissions, a multidisciplinary work at the Whitney Museum of American Art, explored the relationship between modernist ballet and the avant-garde visual arts in New York. Joining them on stage is Dan Byers, director of the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard University. There'll be a short period of time after the talk for Q&A, but in the meantime, I hope you join me in um, welcoming, welcoming them to Armory Live. So I think we're gonna get started by each of you talking a little bit about the exhibitions and then we'll, we'll be in conversation. And um, yeah, I think I'm here as a, as, a, as a referee, but I don't know how much you'll need me. So really looking forward to this. And Lynn, will you start? Okay, um, thank you. Thank you to Julia and Nick for the invitation and um, to Nick for, sorry, Julian and Dan for the invitation and Nick for the conversation. Um, I'm going to open by talking about this. Uh, could we have the other PowerPoint, please? About this exhibition, um, not by walking you through the whole thing, but by focusing on the installation in Washington, D.C. at the National Gallery, and focusing on this lobby area, the entry point, which was also the exit to the show, uh, and the first gallery, which looks at the interwar years, or is one of several galleries that look at the interwar years, which is uh, one point of intersections with transmissions. We were both looking at the U.S. in that moment. But at the National Gallery, the layout of the rooms is such that you end and begin at the same point. In other words, you make a circuit. And the National Gallery, for those of you who've visited, uh, will know that it's an institution where its old master collection is immensely revered, very important, and is the reason that uh, many people come to the gallery. There's a modern, in, there's a modern department, but uh, that was founded much later in the history of the museum, and it's, uh, the National Gallery is not known for, particularly for cutting-edge exhibitions as much as it's known, say, for retrospectives of Vermeer or Tintoretto. So this exhibition is not typical of what you would see in the National Gallery, and um, although it has an historic dimension, the show, uh, for me, began and ended in the present. I'm a curator who's worked mostly with contemporary art, art from the 1960s onwards, and the question as I framed it for myself was a question that we, I think all of us working in the cultural field are facing today with great urgency, the question of in, questions of inclusion and diversity. What do we as curators choose to include in exhibitions and in programs and exhibitions. Who do we make these exhibitions for? Uh, who are they seen by? And in thinking about this, if this is the larger frame, then the next level of framing came about thinking about why um, most museums of modern and contemporary art do not exhibit what is often termed self-taught art, which could be folk art, um, art by what used to be called naives or visionaries, outsider artists, uh, transmitters. There's been a whole range of terms to apply to work that was made 
by individuals who did not have art school training and who didn't necessarily position themselves in relation to uh, Western modernist art or Western art histories. And that can be a great many people, obviously. Uh, and I also was aware that in the past, early modernism, early 20th century modernism had included work by that, by artists within those diverse categories as part of the remit of the institution. And I was interested in why this was no longer the case and what the justifications and validations were for that. And as I began to look at these terms outside a naive, visionary folk artist, I realized that they're all historically specific and that at certain moments across the 20th century, one or other of those terms was privileged and the one we tend to use at the moment is outsider artist. And looking at that term as it was constructed in the early 1970s by an art historian, Roger Cardinal, on the basis of Jean Dubuffet's concept of art brew, that is art made by someone who's solipsistic, indifferent to the world around them, motivated by visions or an, an obsessive compulsive need to express him or herself, indifferent to audience, that this seemed to be totally untenable. In my experience of looking at work increasingly by um, artists who've been marginalized, none of them seemed to fit into that category. And at the same time, it was pretty clearly evident that on the whole, if we don't have labels and we're just looking at art objects, very often it's not possible to tell who was the trained artist and who was not. So if the terms don't provide a credible distinction and the work can't be separated visually, then on what grounds are works like this not in, in or not in the museum? So that was the, f the set of um, guiding questions. And so when you came into the exhibition, I wanted to put all of this in the forefront uh, without simply writing large um, introductory texts, but to put it into play through the objects that one saw in the room. And what you're looking at uh, here is a view of the lobby in which you see work by four artists. And all of them in different ways involve textiles or fiber. You see the same, sorry, I can't see this very clearly, I hope you can. Um, you see work on the wall uh, and on these pedestals, a closer view of some of those objects. Uh, by now you will have seen at least who two of the artists are. But um, for most people who knew some of the artists and not others, it was not possible to say uh, which of these artists had training. And indeed, they, in a different way, all of them had training and studio experience in different terms. Two of them had been in art school at Yale, at, both at Yale as it happened. One of them had what anthropologists would call fireside training. That is the skill set that she used uh, was handed down through family and community. And the other one had worked in a communal studio uh, alongside other artists working in a whole variety of materials and media. And all of them are women, um, the, but that is not something I think one would automatically know either. What I hoped visitors would do would be to see commonalities in terms of materials, fiber, textiles, in terms of form, abstract sculpture, of different times. In, uh, they, these works were all made within a very short chronological period, so all within the same larger cultural context. Um, they were using processes and materials which typically are gender-based, as seen as women's work often, and they all, you could say in different ways, um, reference domesticity and the mundane. Beyond, and so I think it's possible to have to set up conversations within the room around the objects, which are productive to an understanding and an exploration of issues 
raised by the objects without having to see biography as the key and core. Because typically in the work of self-taught artists, as it's often presented, the biography of the artist provides the terms in which the work is received. In other words, the work is symptomatic um, of biographies which often include trauma or disability or disadvantage or disenfranchisement. And that could come about through a variety of means by, in terms of class or race or ethnicity or gender or neurodivergence. So the hope was that this gallery, in setting up this um, dialogue around the works and making evident that the labels or labeling was not the only way into an examination of the work would start to free visitors of having to look at every object and say, which is this? Is it this or is it that? Is it trained or is it untrained? And start to think about larger historical questions. The second gallery which was the first in historical terms, then uh, set up some of these questions by put, looking at the first exhibition that um, brought work that was thought of as American folk into an aesthetic context. And that happened at the Whitney Museum in 1924 when an artist was asked to make an exhibition of the folk art he and fellow artists uh, were collecting for themselves. Up until that point, uh, such artifacts as weather vanes, um, vernacular religious uh, sculpture, um, sh shop signs, uh, Sunday paintings, all of these materials were thought of as part of the historical um, patronage in this country, but as not having uh, aesthetic importance. And the shift came when this work was recontextualized and it was done so on the urging and advocacy of artists. And this provides a model for what you will see as you went through the show again and again, that it was uh, credentialed artists, artists with uh, training, artists who were part of an art system, who reached out to artists that were uh, periphery, peripheral to the mainstream and saw them as peers, not as lesser or different, but as fellow artists and advocated for their work to be shown alongside their own in museums of modern and contemporary art. So in this room, um, you would see a range of um, objects made by uh, mostly artists living in New York, uh, some of whom travel to other parts of the country, Marston Hartley to the southwest, uh, where uh, the work of Patrocino Barella, who is a Hispanic American artist with, uh, who began uh, fixing bultos, which were um, Catholic religious sculpture, and then with encouragement and support from the WPA uh, was able to uh, work full time as a sculptor. And these objects in the front were um, some of the examples he showed. And works like the Barella uh, were shown at the Museum of Modern Art in 1936 in an exhibition. There were works by other artists such as William Edmondson who had uh, been a tombstone carver in Nashville who was given the first solo show by an African-American artist and by a self-taught artist at the museum in 1937. And it was at this time that um, the Museum of Modern Art in particular, but the Whitney too, and galleries, commercial galleries, brought this work into the fold as uh, work that could be shown commensurate with uh, vanguard artists of the time. So there was, a, it, there was a moment of parity when the traditional hierarchies between the center or the mainstream and the margins was uh, eliminated. And if you'd been a f someone who looked at a lot of art in New York in the late 30s, you would have seen this work uh, in galleries, in museums, in ways that we do not today. That's perhaps enough of an introduction, and I'll hand it to Nick.
thank you, Julia and Dan and Lynn for, for having me. I'm gonna just try and race through um, uh, via images the exhibition I showed at the Whitney last year, Transmissions, which um, I described on the surface as an exploration of the synergy between modernist ballet and modernist art in New York in the period bracketing World War II. Um, but the deeper implications were rooted in uh, a kind of attack on the perpetuation of um, heteronormative narratives of American modernism and my own interest in finding uh, origins of queer, experimental, collaborative, transdisciplinary practices that are assumed to have come to prominence much later, um, you know, during and after the 1960s. Um, so in some sense, I was using dance history to illuminate art history differently. Um, so I've arranged the images here more or less in the order in which you would have experienced the exhibition and its specific architecture. The first view is of what you would have seen when you came off the elevator to the top floor of the Whitney where I installed a scrim to subdivide the space and also inhibit one's immediate visual access to the exhibition. Um, so this created a number of layers on which various representations of the body, both still and moving, could be seen coming together almost as if in a collage on, a, on the same plane of vision. I hung a selection of 16 photographs of dancers, artists, and models taken in the 30s and 40s by George Platt Lines in front of the scrim. And what you see in the background is a projected slide. Um, it's a portrait of a dancer by Carl Van Vechten, one of 826 slide portraits that changed constantly in the exhibition. Here you see some of the dancers I collaborated with on the exhibition. It was really through my conversations with dancers that it became clear to me that Dance is generally only welcomed into the museum on the museum's terms and, you know, strangely often decontextualized. So it seemed pressing with so many conversations going on that are often quite circular about dance in the museum to present art and artifacts related to this rather unacknowledged historical intersection of art and dance, but also to show an active engagement with the historical material through dance. Um, what I didn't want was, uh, you know, for historical reenactments uh, or illustrations, but um, something that would actually show a distinction between these historical forms and what's happening in the present. So I worked with 16 very distinct dancers with different training backgrounds, and they entered into this dialogue with me and looked at all the material, and we workshopped a long flexible movement sequence that was performed every day in the galleries, and also evolved over time. Um, this is the view to the Hudson. You see um, a tableau I made uh, using an artwork from the Whitney's collection. At the bottom, it's an Ellie Nadelman sculpture of bronze. And above it is a recreation of a very risque costume for a ballet about a gas station attendant called Filling, Filling Station from 1937. Uh, the costume was designed by the painter Paul Cadmus. So this combination of elements starts to introduce some of the, the ideas that I was interested in. Um, the juxtaposition of a sanctioned artwork with something that has a, a, not such a clear status as an artwork against the backdrop of an urban landscape. Um, and I mean, it also brought in, of course, corporeality, sexuality, and materiality, the contrast of the bronze and this transparent organza of the costume. Um, I think additionally, it questioned the supposed difference in status you know, between these forms, um, dance and the visual arts, and this kind of false separation that I was trying to get to the bottom of. Um, and then finally, of course, it sort of brought in uh, the exterior of the museum, the site of the museum against the sort of artificial um, controlled space of a historical authority within the museum. Here's another more melodramatic view of the same tableau. And then it was important to me that all artworks could be seen, or the majority of the artworks could be seen from both sides. So you see here another George Platt Lines photograph and through the scrim behind it, uh, an arrangement of different sculptures. And when you enter into that space delimited by the scrim, you're confronted with those sculptures arranged in a kind of cityscape, let's say. The nude on the right is actually a portrait of 
uh, ballet's most ardent proselytizer, Lincoln Kirstein. Next to him on the left is a small Man Ray sculpture, a clamp holding these chromed slats that makes this anti-monument called New York. So it also starts to make these kinds of miniature portraits of New York City. Um, this was a, a, in the center of this shot, you see a large, well, also a sort of human-scaled folding screen by the artist Eugene Berman, covered over in portraits, costume designs, set designs for ballet and theater, and it's surrounded by the swarm of costume and set designs by other artists, and also portraits of um, artists who were, you know, collaborators, lovers, uh, their patrons, indicating this very kind of dense, nested, um, socially complicated situation um, that, uh, that sort of actually tied everything together within the show. Um, here you have a view of how works, uh, how I tried to arrange work so that they could sort of be in contact with each other across space and time. Um, very literally here, sort of on the left, again, the Carl Van Vechten slides, uh, almost in communication with the Chelichev painting on the right of a you know, human anatomical figure stripped down to its nervous system. And then these are uh, the Carl Van Vechten slides as I originally found them, with all this interesting information written on their frames, um, you know, identifying the, the person, the date, and they, they bear all sorts of other traces. This is um, Alicia Markova, who's remembered as one of the most famous ballet dancers of the 20th century, wearing a costume by Matisse for the ballet, uh, The Red and the Black. Um, Carmen de la Vallade, uh, it's on and on. I mean, this the. This is really a sort of remarkable um, cast of characters documented by Van Vechten, the uh, ballet costume designer Karinska. Um, let me see, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, this is uh, um, Agnes DeMille looking very Cindy Sherman, um, a dancer named Morris Lenwood about whom very little is known, and another one named Francisco Monsion. And then here's another sort of tableau uh, that I made. This is perhaps the most maniacal one, um, which uh, unites objects of different media and scales. There's a, a video playing on a monitor reflected in the mirror of Balanchine rehearsal tapes. Um, there's these large Ellie Nottleman paper mache uh, circus women, an even larger version in marble of which uh, is at the New York City Ballet. There's a tiny figurine holding up a, um, uh, the calling card of Serge Diaghilev. Um, and then there's also a work by Elaine Sturdivant on the wall, which seems to fall completely out of uh, this chronology, though that work in itself references um, avant-garde ballet history in Europe. Um, this is a small tableau of plaster, late plaster figurines by Ellie Nottleman from the Whitney's collection, um, which in its own way, almost serves as a model for the exhibition itself, these various individuals situated together in the same space. And then I'll just end by showing you images of the exhibition as it really was. What I've shown you, of course, looks very clinical and brightly lit and clean, as install shots do, but um, it was actually quite a dim installation, and um, uh, throughout the day, people were performing in it, and. The, the presence of visitors in the galleries also had a very strong effect. You know, there's this scopic element that's now sort of a normal part of being in a museum with everyone constantly photographing everything. Um, but it was also quite amazing to see how uh, visitors arranged themselves in this space in which nothing was clearly prescribed. They often didn't really know what to do and had to kind of negotiate that and sort of what it is that they wanted to look at and how to combine all of these things. And there was also, um, in some cases, a kind of confusion about who was looking at whom. And that was a dynamic or a sort of power dynamic that the dancers played with um, and flipped around, that sometimes the audience would become the performer to be scrutinized. So that's, that's a quick tour. Um, can I ask you to go, oh. Yeah. Um, oh. Can we go back to Nick's, uh, so if you could go back to the Nadelman, the little sure. um, figures, because we both had, 
a group of these yeah. small um, works that Nadelman made, made very late in his life. Um, after he'd stopped exhibiting, he and his wife Viola had uh, been collecting f what they called folk and peasant art mm -hmm. and had founded the first museum in Riverdale in the Bronx that opened in the 30s with about, figures vary, but maybe 50,000, maybe 80,000 such objects. And Nadelman not only was really interested in this material, he, and it impacted his work, in these late objects, he, um, they were made by casting in molds mm -hmm. and were intended then to be individualized by some hand painting on top of them. And then they were to be sold cheaply. They were unique, but they were um, small and inexpensive. And the model was chalk, 19th century chalkware. And so there's a very close relationship within my, um, my exhibition um, and a founding relationship for some of these uh, interconnections between folk histories and folk artifacts and the work made by um, credentialed artists. But Nadelman, um, as I said, was not showing these. He uh, really had given up on any public presence by mm -hmm. that stage. And um, it's just one instance of what often I was asked was, um, was this historical part of the exhibition about recuperation, mm. bringing back to um, canonical narratives figures who had slipped out or whose practices were no longer known or others who were known at the time and completely disappeared. And for me, um, recuperation is a really problematic term a project that redresses or, or is revisionist is somewhat, um, I think, closer to what I was doing. The, for me, the idea about recuperation suggests that there's a mainstream and then there are things not in it, mm. and you bring those out and you put them back into the mainstream, but basically you don't change anything. You might shift the goalposts slightly, but the structures remain fundamental. Mm. And I was much more interested in a revisionist reading which would suggest there are multiple narratives. Mm. And it's not about putting Nadelman back in, let alone Barella. It's right. about um, thinking of other uh, histories that can be written during the interwar years, as in this instance, um, that change your understanding, that make room for uh, voices that, uh, are, that have been othered in yeah. some ways. How do you feel about these terms, revisionist, recuperative? Uh, I, I mean, I also have a really difficult time with the notion of recuperation. And I, um, you know, I, I see outliers and in some regard transmissions also as um, anti-canonical projects, um, you know, in the sense that there is uh, an active uh, attempt to ask people to look differently, to confront artworks on different terms, to even, you know, come up with new terms as you did with the show. Um, and it, I mean, you know, the, the whole genesis of this exhibition for me had to do with questions about, um, what came before a lot of the things that have been so important to me artistically, what came before uh, Judson, what came before Stonewall, why don't I know about these things? Why is there such a circumscribed uh, modernist narrative? You know, what, what is gained by keeping it so streamlined? Um, but you're right, it wasn't, you know, I, I never felt like I was bringing people back into the fore um, in many ways, you know, Nadelman was quite famous. Chalichev was very famous. George Pat Lyons was very famous. These were artists who were making Vogue covers. They were, um, they were, you know, circulating widely, and their imagery really penetrated um, the public imaginary. So it was only later that they were edited out. Um, and I think, you know, in in both exhibitions, I very much have the sense that um, the way the the sort of formative years of, of American modernism are addressed is to, to locate within them all the, all the things that are supposed to be anathema to modernism. You know, decoration, 
naivete, false naivete, uh, camp, all those things are actually embedded within modernism. And I think that, I mean, there's so much more, of course, in outliers as well. And, and um, but I, I think that was one of the things that kept uh, um, drawing me back into this period was that it was so much more complicated and weird and problematic mm -hmm. and rich than, than I had ever known. Um, and with the Nadelmans in particular, I think what gravitated, what, what brought me towards those, aside from the fact that he was very involved um, in this nexus between art and dance, is that the figures themselves are this kind of archive of gestures um, throughout our history from, you know, uh, sort of almost like cycladic sculpture to um, uh, vaudeville dancers and pinup girls and circus performers and, you know, um, uh, Hellenic uh, grave statuary. And a lot of the, the works that I was looking at were these kind of self-contained archives of, of gesture, of ways of behaving, of uh, ways of inhabiting space that are, that we don't have access to anymore. Um, so I think that that's where that came from. Um, I, I'm really curious about, you know, there, you brought up um, earlier this kind of art brute, um, the, the, the kind of untenable nature of that formulation. I was wondering if you feel that outliers is a kind of, um, that the methodology of that exhibition could be mapped onto Europe, let's say, the European avant-garde and its relationship to self-trained or institutionalized artists or um, its relationship to primitive art objects. Or I, I just ask this because somebody sort of recently asked me to do something similar with transmissions and I felt, I realized I can't do it. It's not that easy to do. No, um, nor do I think this would... Um simply it'd be possible to use it as a model and take it into another context. And in part, it ended up as a strictly American, North American project, American US project, uh, because it became clear to me early on in the research that the narratives of the modernist and the marginal in Europe, are pre in terms of self-taught art, are quite well known, mm. and they are very strictly aligned with uh, incarcerated individuals, what used to be called the art of the insane, mm. and sometimes uh, people who were in jail or in prison. And it begins in 1921-24 with the publication of the um, compendium of drawings by Hans Prinzhorn of uh, people who were um, said to be uh, insane. And those drawings were then, um, in, term, in the book and, and actual drawings, were admired immensely by the surrealists and then collected by Jean Dubuffet and then by Cobra artists and busts. So there's a long history mm. that's very strict and clear in its focus and prioritizing of that particular othering. Um, whereas what I found here was that there's very little that uh, work made by people who were in staying, uh, incarcerated or institutionalized uh, for mm. mental and developmental disabilities, and that those who were other, for other reasons, mm. uh, tended to be on the basis of class and disadvantaged. They couldn't go to art school. They therefore ended up as laborers or in the case of John Kane or others, uh, or race and ethnicity or gender. Uh, meant that they could not become artists as though they wished to be. And that was more or less what went on in the interwar years. So, so the people like um, John Kane uh, or um, Morris Hirschfeld wanted to get into the art world. They, wanted, they knew what it was to be mm. uh, an artist and their aspirations were to have their work shown, exhibited, um, sold, put into museums, and, and in fact, for some of them, they succeeded. In the post-Second World period, the people identified as self-taught do not have those aspirations. They're not um, focused on the art world. They may not know what the art world is. They're making for many other reasons, quite often out of a religious calling, mm. 
and, and others. Mm. So the demographic was quite different, mm. the characterizations were different, and how the work was first um, came to the consciousness or awareness of artists, self, uh, professionalized artists, was totally different. And so over the course of the last century within the United States, questions of race and class and gender and have played perhaps as much, if not more, of a role um, in situating this work than uh, people who were institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about, um, on the one hand, um, the audience for a lot of the work and outliers. Um, you know, there's, there's, of course, the audience for vanguard practice, but then I think there's uh, much more of a range if you think about the audience of, let's say, the work made by the outliers, and that it's something I thought about also in transmissions, is that there was, there was a kind of public and private divide. There was work that was made for public display, and there was work that was made only for circulation among friends or for the artist mm -hmm. herself. Um, and, you know, the, so I, was, I started thinking about that, the nature of works that only exist for a certain time or that, um, you know, that may uh, fade away, like, you know, Ava Hesse saying, I, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about lasting, or Florine Stettheimer mm -hmm. asking for all of her work to be destroyed because it was really only intended for herself and her friends. Um, I, there, there's something very, um, I think, something of that knowledge c comes through in outliers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the kind of idea of the real or imagined audience mm -hmm. or the fantasy of an audience. Um, and yeah, I, I was wondering if you, if you have anything to say about that then in relation to the repression of vernacular languages or the kind of... Um, That's a good question. Um, I think what uh, my primary concern which was really running against what I said was a stereotype of the outsider, was to argue that all these makers had audiences in mind. Mm -hmm. They didn't do it um, out of a kind of obsessive need for self-expression. They, that a need for self-expression, a drive to self-expression may have been part of it, but I think it's part of any artist as mm -hmm. a maker. Um, but an audience was, and therefore the desire to communicate was also always a component. And that didn't mean they necessarily actively went out and hung their work in the studio window as uh, on, 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 or as, as your, Joseph Joachim did or um, Bill Trailer working on the street in, um, sorry, uh, Montgomery, thank you. Um, uh, hanging the works on a line for people to see and perhaps purchase. But they, whether it was Henry Darger mm. or it was um, James Castle, they imagined audiences. Castle actually made, well, he made exhibitions, whether he made them in his imagination or he made them literally in a barn that only he saw is, in a sense, immaterial in mm. this argument. He anticipated than being seen and desired it. Mm. And so um, the question of, an, of a, a small cohort who were um, circulating works amongst themselves in, was not really part of mm. what I was encountering. Mm -hmm. It was, it was mm -hmm. a, a more fundamental drive for communication mm -hmm. that I think I focused on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I was interested in asking you about, you started by talking about it. Um, the relationship with dance histories. Mm -hmm. And you didn't specifically say ballet and you didn't say modern dance. Right. And um, mm -hmm. if I understood correctly, the performers you chose had both ballet training mm -hmm. and performed as modern, within modern dance mm -hmm. repertoires. So um, someone watching the performers who are clearly working of a, with a choreography that's evolved in both those uh, legacies, one is looking at them overlapping and intertwining, mm. but in terms of the history of the relationship between the, the f modernist fine art world, in the 30s it's with ballet and of course American mm -hmm. 
ballet is being founded by Kirstein and, mm -hmm. and Balanchine. But in the, from the 60s onwards, we think of modern dance and the avant-garde. Yeah. Um, and one has superseded the other rather than being intertwined. Right. Um, can you, do you see um, reclaiming or making visible again the, a relationship with ballet being uh, one of the goals or drives of the exhibition? <laughs> no, that's a good question. I, no, I, I, uh, the interesting thing about dance at, in this particular period is that um, all these forms are also, and all these different dance forms are entwined. So you have modern, modernist ballet and modern dance are kind of developing in this um, almost parasitic relationship to each other and really stealing a lot from each other. Um, you know, it, it was, it's not something that I came into this project knowing. Um, it wasn't until I came across this quote by um, Gerald Murphy, the expatriate painter, um, who had also worked uh, making sets for ballet, who said that the ballet was the, the focal point of the whole modern movement. And I sort of thought, well, I didn't know that. I always thought the center was, you know, I don't know, some other imperative. So it kind of gave me this whole other point from which to pivot. And, um, and then, of course, I started to look at ballet, and I realized that actually a lot of what's called ballet is in fact modern dance or you know all these things have bleeding edges and that perhaps the more productive thing would be to focus on how far those edges bleed rather than you know on defining something like saying this is ballet this is this is interesting um, it's it's you know I don't want to say that it was a subtext but ballet became a kind of glue that allowed me to talk much more clearly I think about protagonists who were um, uh, you know, who had fled to the U.S. or migrated to the U.S. or um, uh, people who were not really allowed access to uh, the, the worlds of fine art and sort of high art dance, but were also contributing to the culture as sort of second-class citizens or, um, you know, these uh, proto-queer social networks um, that were uh, very active in shaping the culture. So you know, all that could sort of be told, I think, most easily through the prism of, of ballet, through the kinds of images that it generated, this kind of copious amount of photographs. Um, and you know, then it led, led me to understand that the, the advent of photography as a fine art form was also dovetailed with the development of modern dance as an art mm -hmm. form. And so I think all these, um, for me, very helpful linkages started to be made once I, once I began looking through dance you know, which was a rather oblique way to, to, to look at this period. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the initial interest for me certainly had been, I, I have, I've always been following performance and dance since the 60s, and uh, about eight years ago or something, I was at the Walker Art Center, I was invited to go into the storage when they just acquired all the Merce Cunningham sets and props and so on, and costumes, and they were just on display in the racks, you know, mid Agnes Martin and Marcel Broter's works, and somehow that really stuck with me to see all these things together, um, and and it you know threw off a lot of sparks and, and eventually sort of led me here. Um, yeah. I'm sort of interested about the the form of the exhibition and how each of you approached storytelling through exhibition and exhibition design and especially as it relates to uh, questions around biography. I mean, you noted, Lynn, that you sort of purposely repressed or excluded at least some of the kind of biograph biographical information that's often given for those outlier artists, whereas your project, Nick, has a lot to do with biographies and social networks. And how do you kind of animate those things in the exhibition itself and the kind of narrative potential of that, that form? Um, I, I think that it's a question of when information is given. It's not in the in this area of the crossover between um, self-taught and credentialed artists. There's been a call in recent years for what's often termed an even playing field, where you just put it all out together. And I'm not an exponent of that. Um, I think difference determines differently, to use a useful phrase, Van Wagner's. And the difference needs to be acknowledged. 
and it's, it's, um, it, it, it's an imperative within work, but it's, it's when and how that's um, brought to the fore. So uh, I, I guess I wouldn't want to start um, by putting a wall text or even an object label that Judith Scott, for example, was born with Down syndrome and was uh, deaf from birth. Because I think if you do that, then everything that happens when you look at her work will have this as the kind of limits and frame. Um, and that it's at some point, as one ex starts exploring more of her work and positioning it in different contexts in relation, say, to the Jessica Stockholder or the Nancy Shaver, um, but then starts looking amongst Sc uh, Scott's own works and seeing differences between earlier works and later works or consistencies. And it's, it's at that point knowing something about what materials she had access to, as one wants to know with any artist, and, and other factors that one would take that as, as um, an important piece of information on board. So it's, it's somehow about ti timing and framing. And I think, um, particularly for the more contemporary part of this exhibition, unlike the earlier part where it was um, structured by exhibitions which in institutions like the Marden and the Whitney brought this work into a public arena. In the very last section that looks from the 80s onwards, it, there isn't that structure. It's, a, it's quite a different one, which I would call a curatorial fabulation or, a, say, phantasmatic constellations. Um, the term curatorial fabulation has been used by um, Catherine Gentleson and Thomas Lax in their writings on um, Ronald Lockett. I've used it in relation, uh, curat uh, critical fabulations in relation to Judith Scott. And it means in part setting up situations in which this work might have been shown with other work of the time, uh, didn't happen to be, but there are meaningful connections which may be thematic or material um, or in relation to gender issues or, or to other biographical factors. But um, so the works, the works within the gallery speak to each other across um, the different biographies. And these are very plausible situations. And the plausibility is made by the conversations amongst the works. Um, so I'm, I think I'm getting off track, but that's, I'm, that's where I'm heading. I think the way you described the, the first room of the exhibition, um, where you kind of let the objects set up conversations amongst themselves and, and also raise questions or provoke curiosity is really key. And I mean, one of the ways in which received histories uh, sort of entrench themselves, I think, is a lot of times through this uh, omniscient voice of the institution. So in my case, I decided to write all the labels myself in a way in which the museum would never be able, you know, I, we tried and they said, no, we can't do that, we can't use that language. And I said, fine, I'll just sign my labels. And that became a good solution, I think. Um, but I also really wanted each work or each sort of trace of dance, each program to kind of present itself and often also tell me how it wanted to be shown. So in that case, you know, I knew that the transparent costume had to be flying in front of the Hudson. Um, I, I think there was, a, there was a kind of extreme care on the one hand, but also an irreverence that, that I felt was needed in order to take the work really seriously. Um, that to kind of present it in, in the ways in which these things are usually presented would continue to kind of mute things. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the overall design of transmissions was um, very much intended to kind of you know, just pull you through in, in a certain way and, and then bring you into this space um, that did not necessarily feel like a museum, but, you know, uh, yeah. Can I ask you a question about, there's the, there's the notion of authorship mm -hmm. and taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. There's a question of subjectivity mm -hmm. that the 
curator has, and then there's been this term auteur, mm -hmm. curator auteur. Mm -hmm. It's not used so much now, but it was flying around five or six years ago. Um, do you feel, well, in part you, you addressed it by saying you wrote the labels yourself, but wh where and how do you think subjectivity uh, um, is made evident? And, and to what degree need it be? Um, and are all curators authors or auteurs, or mm. uh, where do you see yourself as an artist, curator, scholar? It's a, it's a lot of questions. <laughs> I, um, I'm trying not to pin you down. No, I'm trying to give you something to work you. with. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no. <laughs> I, um, uh, Again, I hope to make it clear that this was um, uh, that's not not necessarily an institutional um, uh, project, but but a kind of experiment. So um, I think that was built into the show in the fact that it, it sort of the process of its making, but also the process of all its elements coming together was was quite imp improv improvised. Um, there was actually no way that any of us could anticipate how, uh, how the artworks, the documents, um, the dancers, the audience would all st interact and, and what that would actually mean for an exhibition. And it was a real challenge um, to, the, to the museum. So I think um, in that sense, uh, my role as the orchestrator of all of this was made, I think, kind of self-evident. Um, but um, I've also heard from a lot of people that I, what I was doing was more of a vanishing act as an artist, you know, that I, I wasn't, it was unclear where I was or what I was doing. And people kept saying, well, what about your work? Where's your work? And I said, you know, I, everything, every pedestal, every, you know, rotating, you know, I just <laughs> I didn't really know how to answer that. And I, I still have a hard time distinguishing it. Um, I don't feel comfortable with, um, referring to myself as an artist curator. I'm not sure that sort of splitting up the roles um, to account for this uh, gesture is, is all that productive. Um, but, but I mean, if, if an exhibition such as this one asks people questions that they can't answer about who the artist is and what the artist has done, I think that's really productive. Um, I mean, I, so I, I'm not sure. How do you, how do you feel about um, subjectivity coming into some of the choices that you made. I mean, there, I feel, you know, since it's not biographically determined and not strictly chronological or regional, um, the way in which you organized outliers allowed for sort of so many different vectors to come together. Um, and some of them really surprised me, such as Senga Ngudi and Bruce Connor. I never would have thought of them in relation, you know. Um, so I'm curious about that. Um, thank you. I, I recognize that there's a considerable amount of subjectivity in conceiving and realizing an exhibition. Yeah. It, it's, it's the case. Um, at the same time, I was trying to make an exhibition with an argument. There are many other types of exhibitions, but this um, was for me really the driving factor. Um, so I was trying to make the arguments as historically and rationally and objectively grounded as I could, mm. recognizing that nonetheless mm, that would not make a show, that I yeah. was still making a great many decisions and that the decisions were simply not about selection of objects but they're the framing of them, the, the argument that an exhibition display makes mm -hmm. is an argument. Um, and on that, um, excuse me, on those grounds, I guess I feel it is overtly subjective. Once one's moving objects around uh, as much as in any other moment. Um, on the other hand, I work in a very large institution with many departments mm. and things do not happen just because I wish them. 
Um, so there's a lot of negotiation yeah. in terms of the presentation, the language of labels, who writes labels, all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's, um, it's, a, it's a team effort, um, perhaps more than in other institutions I've worked in, uh, smaller ones with other kinds of structures. Mm. Do you see, I mean, this is similar to a question I asked before, but do you see that outliers um, uh, might be a proposal for how museums could display their collections in the future? Um, I think that this is, well, this is obviously a temporary exhibition. Yeah. It's, it will pass. And that the next step, in a way, the challenge is to institutions with collections and how they hang them. Um, another show on this material will not change anything. Real change will happen when either things are brought out of storage and put into new contexts, new acquisitions are made, mm. that the narratives widen and multiply. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not a collections curator. Right. Um, and I'm hoping that there will be resonance and that Part of that resonance will involve uh, the writing of uh, different histories from the ones that we have for the moment um, in the presentations, particularly of American art in the interwar years, but in, in modernist uh, displays mm -hmm. in general. So I think we're about an, an hour in, and I have more questions, but I wonder if we should see about the audience and take some questions now. I think there's a microphone that my, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your remarks thus far. You've just mentioned the idea of collecting, and so I'm particularly interested in the ways in which um, I'm thinking of the Zwerner show that just opened that to some degree is overlapping with some of the figures that were in the transmission show, um, how you do or do not feel your shows bumping, bumping up against a kind of shift, always shifting market for these objects, um, you know, that may have been more low key and now is maybe going to heat up a little bit. And I, you know, I think that's something you can obviously both answer. I, um, I felt really lucky in that sort of when, when transmissions finally came to pass and, and opened, it was kind of within a time frame where people could still be thinking about um, the Carolee Schneeman exhibition, the Black Mountain College exhibition, um, you know, uh, look forward to, um, well, there was the Radical Bodies exhibition at the New York Public Library, then the Judson exhibition, the coming Lincoln Kirstein exhibition, um, the exhibition you're talking about at David Zwerner, um, that Clearly, there is a hunger for um, uh, other ways of, of addressing um, sort of what precedes us and uh, how all these things connect. So, um, I mean, I think in terms of uh, the market, uh, you know, I was mainly dealing with um, attempts to capture, uh, you know, multi-authored, time-based art forms that have no market, um, m most of which are lost. So I think, you know, I, that's, that's a very um, different focus, I think, than, than the kind of huge uh, cache of, of artworks that are on display at the gallery, um, which are, are wonderful and fascinating, and I actually never expected to see half of them in my lifetime, so you know, it's wonderful that they've been brought up to the surface. Uh, I think there was an expectation on some part of the art world that um, particularly the, the kind of professional uh, sectors of the self-taught world that this would change the visibility and change the market. Uh, in the last couple of years, one of the auction houses has done uh, an auction of work in this, uh, where many of the artists who are included in the show. The market is, is not commensurate with um, 
contemporary market. Um, I, there was nothing I could do to stop some kind of seismic shift or, or encourage it. I, and it neither has happened. It's um, fortunately, I think, um, that would be, I mean, I, market issues are other issues, I think. And, and in a sense, a, a large historical show of, of material made by American artists could have uh, had very different insurance values from the works that were in this show. This was not uh, a show that needed indemnification, for example. That yeah. Yeah, many thanks for this uh, presentations. And I think you answered already lots of questions which uh, went to my mind. But I would like to ask you to focus again on two points. And uh, one is, is more or less because you start both with a narrative and anti-normative narrative, uh, but from di different perspectives and for artist perspective and for curatorial perspective. And so um, you tr in the discussion about subjectivities or authorships, which is very, you know, there's a lot of similarity, but there is difference. Yeah? Uh, there, there's very clear difference. And I would be very curious how you would face this difference and its historical dimensions in doing shows like in Lynn's case in reference to artists like Mike Kelly or others who did projects in this direction, or in your case in the, the whole institutional critique tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other side of the question would be what happens when the inside, uh, the outside becomes inside, yeah, and uh, what, you know, what is your, is there a difference when in the positions of the curator and the artist, the artist comes and go, what the curator might stay, uh, what is the effect on that, what, is there a difference in the reception, yeah, especially in Nick's case, I would be very interested how the reception was when in the dance world and in the art world, is there a difference in that dimension as well? Um, thank you for those questions. Uh, I'll start with a second um, question. I mean, we actually spoke a little bit about, um, you know, this idea that that there are many points of overlap between the two exhibitions, but there's also some almost opposites or, or divergences. So when you talk about the uh, what happens when the outside comes to the inside, um, which you know, in, in some ways, Lynn's exhibition is an exhibition of exhibitions in which the outside was brought to the inside, um, whereas I felt that what I was doing was talking about um, things that were always on the inside or for a very long time occupied the central spotlight of the inside and were then pushed to the outside. Um, in terms of the reception of the show, it was quite interesting though because um, I, don't, I don't know what to attribute this to. Maybe the way that um, dance appears in museums now um, and is, is sort of tied to a kind of spectacle effect. Um, but it was not possible for people to see it either as an artwork or as an art history. It was, the subject was dance. So it was written about and, and in interesting ways by um, people who were interested in dance and dance history. Um, but there was a strict divide there, which I, I found quite surprising. Um, in, in something that attempted to sort of flow backwards and forwards. Um, I think um, in terms of my, um, my position as an artist making this exhibition as a work, uh, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I sort of skirted the question when, when Lynn asked me, um, but it does, uh, um, it does come out of uh, a background, um, uh, you know, and in, in some sense also a dissatisfaction maybe with a legacy of institutional critique and what's come of it and how it's aestheticized now. Um, so, uh, you know, I think in that sense, this exhibition sent a lot of very confusing signals because, um, you know, it's so kind of opulent. Uh, there, there's uh, such a, an overload of affect and historical information within all these different aspects of the show that um, 
I think maybe it, it was it had more of a scrambling effect than anything, but I'm I'm okay with that. Um. Uh, I think one way to answer the question would be to say that the notion of outliers, as I understand it, um, meaning something which is at a distance from an aggregate, from the norm, in a non-fixed relationship, so it can get nearer or farther apart. Uh, it can recalibrate and constantly renegotiate that relationship. Is therefore contrary to the idea of a center and a periphery, or a mainstream and a margin, which are fixed relationships and hierarchical ones. And in trying to introduce the idea of outliers, um, I don't think I have succeeded in part because the title I don't think captures that the outliers and the and is not a relationship. It's a, uh, the title isn't exactly mine, but um, that said, I don't think it's um, conveying what I want. I also don't want to use outliers as a label anachronistically. I don't want to go back and say, well, Charles Sheeler really, who's a vanguard artist, um, was really an outlier. He, the model that was functioning and the discursive frameworks for the interwar years into the 60s, a modernist model has a center and a periphery. Um, one appropriates from the other. It's not a two-way relationship, and there's no agency on the part of those who are, the, who are othered, whether it's pre-Columbian or tribal art or children's drawings. Or, but um, if one's thinking of another model that around outliers norms, outliers do have agency, um, and they negotiate situations. And also, if one thinks about multiple individuals with multiple subjectivities rather than as, as, as a fixed identity, then one may be an outlier in some respects uh, relative to certain areas of experience or condition, uh, but not in relation to others. And so I think that can be a way to look at the art world today when we don't have avant-garde, for sure, um, and where um, artists can choose to position themselves at a distance as a position of resistance or strength, as Bell Hooks has talked about it, and as we might say uh, Forrest Best did, or um, Matt Mulliken has positioned that person. Um, if Mul Matt has multiple identities as an artist, that person occupies a different one from Matt as the professional artist. And so if one uses this notion of outliers in the present, I think it, it can be helpful for setting up different kinds of relationships based in many different um, states and conditions of subjectivity, and not all of them having to do with art practice, but to do with gender or heteronormativity, gender relative to heteronormativity and, and so forth. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, one, one connection between uh, the things that each of you said is that, um, um, Lynn, you, you mentioned the 1924 Whitney exhibition, which was the first time that folk material got brought into a museum, albeit a very new museum at that, at that time. Um, and, and that happened because there were artists, um, uh, academy artists, who uh, brought that material to the Whitney. Um, Nick's show is, is, uh, sounded like it was kind of a remarkable counterpoint to the institutional problems that you described facing you at the National Gallery uh, in terms of putting together an exhibition because it, it sounds like, Nick, like you, you were the artist and they somehow, uh, maybe this is not correct, ceded curatorial control to you. And I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question is besides pointing that out, although one question that comes to mind is should we have more uh, exhibitions in major museums that are curated by artists rather than uh, 
aren't historically trained PhD curators. No, no offense, Lynn. <laughs> I just want to clarify something that was brought up by that. I'm not sure about that idea, but <laughs> um, I, I, I worked with the, the transmissions was the result of a year-long um, dialogue with a curator with Elizabeth Sussman who really allowed for um, the focus of the exhibition to emerge very naturally and then Scott Rothkopf came on board and I worked with curators in the performance department at the Whitney. The entire institution came together in this incredible ensemble effort um, and really let me work until the very last minute um, and, and sort of understood the nature of the project and problem solved with me and, and you know, went to great lengths to make this possible. And I, I honestly can't think of many institutions that would make something like that possible, so I feel very lucky um, because it was, you know, it was very, very important and, and moving to have such an experience. Um, the dialogue and then also this kind of great team of, of people um, getting behind a project that didn't have a clear uh, end result in mind, um, but really was always sort of one experiment after the other. Uh, in this morning's conversation, there was uh, some discussion about artists being able to do things in museums that curators couldn't do. And uh, the classic case that always comes to mind is Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum, where uh, Fred Wilson in Baltimore in the his historical museum brought out of uh, storage uh, slave shackles, um, whipping posts, many, many objects that referenced a history that the exhibits uh, and the narratives within the galleries did not acknowledge and brought those into a fuller, larger narrative. Um, it would have been, presumably at that moment, this is 1990, is it, or 89? 92, I think. 92. Yeah. I, this was something uh, an on-staff curator would have, in many institutions, would have uh, found very difficult. And there was a time, I think, when uh, curators would ask artists to do work for them that they felt they couldn't do in their own institutions. And that was a moment. And I think we have got to another moment where curators uh, have stepped up to take on board responsibilities or chosen to represent other histories and other positions increasingly. And I think it's important that we as curators do that. And um, with certain training that we write other narratives, and I think it's our role in part to do that. I don't think we should be asking artists to, uh, we, we can't ventriloquize artists. I don't think we should be doing that. Um, but I do think artists can offer perspectives uh, of many kinds which are not, um, which are not being, um, where the strings are not being pulled by the curators. And, and your uh, account of your process sounds ideal where the curators are not anticipating yeah. that you're going to do this for them, but they actually open the door to something that's going to evolve without um, a goal in mind. I think our time is up. This is a good place to, to leave it. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you. Yeah.